under poverty measuring line till today. Bearing this notion in mind, donors use aid as carrot and stick effort to execute their political interest at the expense of weak, poor and destitute African people through providing aid and donation for years. Most developed nations need to see weak and powerful leaders in developing nations. Many critics oftentimes recommended African leaders to exploit their natural resources thoroughly by resetting and freeing up the mindset of their people from obsession to aid money. As there is no free lunch in the eyes of foreign donors, whatever aid and donation they offer to developing nations, they don't do it with mere sense of charity, rather they use it as a tool to dictate the socio-economic and political direction these nations should take. Understanding such Western world anti-development effort to developing nations, many scholars are repeatedly calling on leaders of third world countries to come up with some counter strategies. One of the African all-time geniuses and who has taught in various reputable universities including Harvard School of Economics, Zambian economist Dr. Dambi Samoyo in her bestseller book entitled Dead Aid describes aid as a cancer. She further argued that that especially humanitarian aids provided for the third world nations have never alleviated the recurring problems of the people. She stresses that if aid providers are truly keen and passionate about helping Africa, they should work on investment and saving. Um, the problem is that it is malignant and uh, the book basically outlines uh, the many many reasons why it is that aid has failed. Uh, to deliver on its original promises. So let me just take you a little bit back uh, in history as to what the origins of the aid model sure. uh, are. So the 1950s and 60s were a time when uh, many African countries in particular, but emerging countries in general, were um, coming out of a colonial period. Mm -hmm. And um, at this time there was um, a literature by, uh, in the economics space um, by people such as Chinnery and Strout in the, 19, the 1966 paper where they basically identified a very simple equation that savings would lead to investment and investment would lead to growth. Sure. But the argument at that time was that in poor countries there was no savings because these were newly formed countries that didn't have the requisite savings that could lead to investment and therefore lead to growth. So um, basically policymakers at the time said instead of savings, we'll use aid right. and the aid would fuel investment. for the savings. Correct. Sure. Uh, and aid would lead to investment and that would lead to growth. And the idea was that you would get not only growth, but you would have an alleviation of poverty mm -hmm. because with growth you could then move people out of poverty. But if you look back over the past 60 years where Africa has received over one trillion dollars of aid, um, the issue then becomes on those two metrics, growth and poverty, have things improved? And the answer is a resounding no. To illustrate, in the 1970s, 10% um, of Africans lived on a dollar a day. Mm -hmm. Now over 70% of right. Africans are living on a dollar a day. Um, so things have got fundamentally worse. And if you look at uh, growth, again, Africa, to, to quote Paul Collier, who's my uh, PhD supervisor, Africa is actually shearing off. So things are getting worse when the rest of the world is moving in one direction. Africa is going in a completely different direction. Um, first of all, with respect to the five years, it was an example in the book, and I think it's really important not to focus on that number of five years. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, we can't have a blanket prescription, very different levels of economic development. Zambia, my own country, is very different from Ghana, very different from Somalia, which is a failed state. So um, I think to focus on the five years, per se, is to miss the broader point that we do need a finite, transparent exit strategy. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, programs, aid programs that have worked, the Green Revolution in uh, India, or the interventions in South Korea, or the aid interventions through the Marshall Plan, have worked, I believe, because they were finite. They were short, sharp, and finite, as opposed to the open-ended commitments that we see in Africa, where governments start to view uh, aid income as permanent income and therefore do not need to seek alternative ways of financing the country. So far, very handful African nations are striving to address the burning question of food security issues of their people. From East African region, Ethiopia is among registering tangible progress on this area. It is heavily working to address the issue of food self-sufficiency and uh, its effort is bearing fruits. For Africa, we must, however, move beyond emergency food aid we must prioritize food production. We have the technologies to feed Africa. Africa does not need bowls in hand to beg for food. Africa needs seeds in the ground to produce food for itself. When farmers are provided with the right technologies, they can feed their countries. Our flagship program 
called the Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation, or TAAT, has already provided 12 million farmers with climate resilient crop varieties within just two years. In Ethiopia, tart supported hinterland varieties have allowed it to cultivate 675,000 hectares. It's reduced its wheat imports by 80% in two years. This year, it will not import any single grain of wheat. And with our support, Ethiopia will become a major wheat exporter next year and export 1.2 to 1.5 million metric tons of wheat to Kenya and Djibouti. That's what we should be doing. To tackle the effects of the Russian war in Ukraine on food security in Africa, our bank approved, our board of our bank approved on May 20, 2022, a $1.5 billion African emergency food production facility. The incumbent administration of Ethiopia has set up a 10 years economic perspective plan to make Ethiopia the beacon of African prosperity by 2030 by reforming the macroeconomic imbalance through revitalizing its economic policy and introducing homegrown economic strategy through liberalizing the economy and majorly focusing on mechanizing the agriculture sector which holds majority of the country's GDP. A government is optimistically working to ban wheat import from overseas in the next couple of years. Over the past year, acute food insecurity in Africa has increased by over 60% as the effect of COVID-19 continues to ag aggravate our fragile economies. Floods, droughts, desert locusts, and other climate-related natural disasters have increased food insecurity for millions of our citizens. With 60% of the world's arable land in Africa. It is of utmost importance that we need to use our natural asset to maximize agricultural output and feed our people without reliance on external assistance. In the past two years, Ethiopia has made substantial investment in int intensifying in summer wheat production through irrigation. Our farmers have been able to control and manage production factors to maximize yields using irrigation. Nationally, we have attained production over 20 million quintals of irrigation wheat farmed on over 500,000 hectares. This has generated nearly 60 billion per in income to our farmers. These efforts are generating great results and will in the imaginable future, begin to contribute to our food security and self-sufficiency, despite the climate variability our region is confronted with. One of the toughest challenges we face in Ethiopia is dealing with the effect of deforestation. While a century ago, Ethiopia's forest coverage was 35%, over the past two decades, our forest coverage standards at just 4%. We believe afforestation is one of the most effective ways of climate change mitigation. Beginning in 2019, we launched a major reforestation initiative under the slogan Green Legacy. After addressing the problem of its people food demand, the Ethiopian government is even aspiring to export cereal foods and crops overseas to generate foreign currency and to realize this extensive and mechanized wheat irrigation and cluster farming is becoming a common experience in different parts of the country. Ethiopia's initiative of expanding mechanized and cluster-based irrigation farm of wheat is becoming a good model for the rest of Africa. Bale and RC zones are the major wheat cluster developers in Oromia region among other zones. The farmers develop wheat producers both through regular rain and using irrigation during dry months of the year. So the farmers harvest at least three times in a year from a given single plot. Head of Agriculture Office of Bale Zone Ali Mohammed says the introduction of mechanized wheat cluster farming trend in Bale Zone is well undergone as per the direction set by the government to address food insecurity and to stop with import from overseas. <laughs>
This train, trend of agriculture in Balizon and in our country is obvious. The trend of agriculture in previous time was hand to mouth. Transforming the farmers in the agriculture was not implemented before. If we take Bali, about 95% of farming system was too traditional before the past three years. Only 5% of the total agriculture practice was mechanized. The 5% was undergone by a rich and wealthy personality. By then, only rich and investors used to practice mechanized farming who plow by tractors and harvest by combiners. However, since the past four years, in related to the coming of the new leadership, the agriculture sector has been given prior focus by understanding the country's potential. Among the initiatives taken by the government mechanizing the agriculture trends backed by modern farming technology is the leading initiative. Chief Administrator of Bali Zone Abdul Hakim notes that increasing product and productivity in the agriculture sector is one of the top priorities of his administration. Bali Zone is in the city of Bali Zone. We have a lot of people in the when the name Bali is mentioned, agriculture comes to everybody's mind because Bali has vast arable and fertile land in Oromia. It is one of the zones in Oromia region which is known for its agriculture products and productivity. Based upon a government's roadmap which is aspired to mechanize the agriculture through the introduction of cluster farming so as to address problems related to food in security. Not only that, according to the government's plan which aimed at increasing product and productivity to solve shortage of wood supply for domestic market and aspire to ban wheat import from abroad, our region has undergone immense activities. We developed wheat both through irrigation and annual rainfall. When we say we have to ban foreign wheat import, it is a must to decode farmers from loafing by oxen into mechanized farming. Farmers of both Bali and RC are trending with cluster farm. Every farmer is enjoying the advantage of mechanized farming and health and merit of cluster farming over the traditional farming system. This woman used to ask for favor from farmers of her neighborhood to plow her plots, but now due to the introduction of cluster farming, her farm plot is plowed by members of the cluster she belongs to. She witnessed that cluster farming is the best way of farming that reduces unnecessary work load from smallholder and weak householders. The introduction of cluster farming has elevated work overload. For example, our plot is plowed by trucks, we plow by trucks and harvest by combiners. This trend has never been known here before. Before the launching of cluster farming, we used to plow our plot separately. Each and every household used to produce alone be it. Sowing, avoiding the weeds, harvesting when the crops get matured used to be carried out at household level. The introduction of cluster simplified workloads for female households where females lead the household as a head of the 
family. My message for other farmers is that farmers should take the trend of class of farming as a blessing. And my herald for the government is that the government should carry out this cluster trend without interruption for the future. Previously, our farming system was very scattered, which was done separately per the interest of one's own desire. But since the coming of the new leadership, the agriculture experts have come up with new farming trends per the direction given by the government. The DS organized and mentored us on the merit of cluster farming based upon their assistance. We farmers started to apply their demonstration by practicing cluster farming. The DAS taught us on the ways how to select and prepare farm plot, mentored us on the frequency of plot, taught us the application of fertilizers and the selection of quality seeds. The introduction of cluster has ample advantage over traditional farming system. Cluster farming embraces every household equally in a given cluster. It holds both poor and rich households. In cluster system, rich households assist the poor in terms of providing all the necessary agriculture input. Those who couldn't be able to buy insecticides, pesticides, fertilizers, and selective seeds assisted by capable farmers in a given cluster. For instance, our cluster has 80 households and 72 of us are male and the rest 8 are females. The females are assisted by us, but had it been the old agriculture system, it would have been tough for them to produce crops. These farmers are encouraged to develop their produces with serious follow-up by the Federal Regional Zonal Agriculture Bureaus. Agriculture experts closely follow up coach farmers to practice modern farming systems. Development assistant workers or DS mentor farmers on how to prepare their plots, teach them about the benefit of developing crop through cluster, manage the ratio of fertilizer intake, lecture on how weeds avoided and tell how to opt pesticides and insecticides and also mentor the way in which farmers create market linkage and entertain value chains during sales. <laughs> We've undergone massive work so far starting from identifying farm plots and sowing seeds, applying fertilizers, launching week control weeks. Now the crop is maturing. You guys remember the way we inspected and sorted out weeds during our first round. Farmers used to complain about the killing power of pesticides in the process of nurturing their crops. Your crop has under curious inspection. We have been carrying out serious follow after going through keen follow-up we have reached here however we are noticing crop disease here and there luckily in this village it is not being seen but in other places it is happening there are three types of crops fungi these are fungus of leaves steam and fruit so that by identifying the types of crops disease or fungi we have to treat our crops since you are head of each cluster to a serious follow-up Gadisa Kiltu is a well-known farmer in Sinana district. He is very successful in his agriculture career. He vows that the introduction of cluster farming in his province solves so many problems for the farmers. He explains that cluster farming embraces all farmers together. According to him, former leaders used to give prior focus for rich farmers and attention has never been given to small holding farmers. However, the current leadership mechanized the agriculture in the way it suits for each and every farmer's Equally regardless of wealth and capital they possess. He gives his testimony that he has never seen such keen and profound governments follow up in the agriculture to increase product and productivity. <laughs> 
Jiran yang mau zaman kanan untuk family duraan ya. Jika kanan beratam ni. I'm familiar with farming. I grow up into it. Ever since my childhood, up until today, I do farming. During old days, we used to plow traditionally by oxen. But now, thanks to God, we have reached here and the possessed tractor and the combine. So many farmers take my achievement as a role model. Our cluster has about 100 farmers into it. I enjoy farming very much. I am living an idle life. I have grinding mill. It accommodates eight workers. I created job for many people. The presence of my grinding mill solved the burden from the community. They used to go to towns in very far places in search of grind mill. The combiners have created job for more than 20 unemployed individuals. Stamrat's family owns a food factory called Etababur. His family used to be a farmer and their startup is agriculture. The embarking of cluster farming, especially the cluster develops through irrigation solve the ever existing shortage of wheat supply for their food factory in Oat. The quality, quantity and supply of wheat in the market is so satisfactory. It is uncommon to get surplus wheat supply this autumn time before. We have been getting wheat throughout the year without any fluctuation from the farmer and unions. He added, every food factory owners are really appreciating the introduction of wheat mechanized farming this time because we are a primary witness of its advantage. He noted. Our organization is named Tababarut Food Complex. The ownership is belong to our mother. Very long time ago, we came here to Bali Robi in search of suitable market for business. We are from Bali Kasera. Our parents used to lead their life by animal husbandry. From herding cattle, we transferred into farming and we bought tractors and combiners and into, we went into producing edible oil. After that we built grinding mill that uh, grinding mill grown up into food processing factory. Our factory produces flour and macaroni and our future plan is to embark spaghetti and biscuit machinery in collaboration with Ethiopian Development Bank. The launching of cluster farming has strongly mitigated the shortage of wheat supply for our factory. Above all, cluster farming solved our problem in relation with different quality of raw wheat. But now since the seed is provided to the farmers by Ethiopian and Oromia selected seed enterprises, we receive quality wheat which is uniform in its quality. Especially the embarking of lowland wheat irrigation has solved shortage of wheat supply for factories. It is uncommon to get wheat during this time before. However, now we receive wheat developed through irrigation from farmers. There is a big increase of harvest over the past couple of years.